please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 44. This is God's word. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Please be seated. Well, in November 1992, a farmer in Suffolk, England, lost a hammer on his land. So he enlisted the help of his friend, Eric Laws, to help him retrieve it. Uh, Laws had recently received a metal detector as a retirement present, which he now put to good use to try to find this hammer. Uh, But his hopes were dashed to find the hammer. When his metal detector went off, and he dug it up, and it was just a few coins. However, upon closer inspection. These coins were rather old. There are rather a lot of them. And he kept on finding more of them, along with a few spoons and things like this. And as he cottoned on to what he was finding, he called the authorities up and the police came and they brought in professional archaeologists. And he had stumbled upon what today is the largest collection of treasure from Roman Britain. Almost 15,000 coins and gold and silver jewelry and other artifacts like this, all of which today you can find in the British Museum. So Eric Laws couldn't believe his luck. He never did find that hammer. But he did find, he did find, a treasure that he could never have dreamt of. A treasure which, yes, went into the hands of the authorities, but for which he was handsomely rewarded in the millions of pounds. Well, in our first parable this morning, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to treasure hidden in a field. In our second parable, he likens the kingdom of heaven to a pearl of great value. You notice the similarity between the two, treasure and a precious pearl. The focus is on the worth and the value of the kingdom. Now, the kingdom of heaven here, it's all about the saving reign of Christ as king. It's a spiritual kingdom uh, to do with the salvation of sinners. Calvin writes, uh, I mentioned this a few weeks ago in a previous parable, He says that it pertains to the forgiveness of sins, salvation, life, and utterly everything that we obtain in Christ. So, of course, Christ reigns over everything else in life, what we might call the civil or the external kingdom, everything outside the scope of salvation. But the kingdom of heaven is wrapped up with salvation. And Jesus, wanting to underscore the supreme value and excellence of the kingdom, uses these pictures of treasure and a pearl. Now, just another note. I know that people can come to these parables and think that the man or the merchant is Jesus. The idea is that Jesus purchased his church and those who are precious to him Let's just say that that's a very rare view. Uh, Among the commentaries, they all seem to prefer the more natural reading, which is the sinner finding salvation in the kingdom. And that does seem to me the primary way to understand these parables. Because Jesus is, he's not making a point about our inherent worth. Outside of Christ, we are sinners and rebels. We're not to be compared with treasure and riches. No, Jesus sets before us these pictures not to puff us up, but to fill us up with amazement at the kingdom of heaven. 
And I'd like for us to notice a few things this morning about these parables. And the first thing to notice with me is the vividness of these illustrations. The vividness of these illustrations. Jesus, as the master illustrator, knows how to win our hearts and minds by giving us pictures everyone can immediately grasp. And you notice the different shades of these illustrations. Treasure, that which is stored up and is kept safe. Something even a child can wonder about. You know, conjures up an idea of vast riches buried and just waiting to be discovered. Perhaps on some epic voyage. Something worth investing your very life to obtain. Think of the theme and everything from Treasure Island all the way through to The Hobbit. Or even without the adventure part, when we read in Hebrews 11 of Moses considering the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, we understand the import because the treasures of Egypt brings to mind opulence and fortune. The pyramids and the artifacts and the luxury of Pharaoh's household. Uh, perhaps the Jews in Jesus' day were reminded of the plundering of the Egyptians. Uh, you remember when the Israelites left Egypt in Exodus 12, the Egypt, they asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and, and clothing, and they plundered the Egyptians. Or perhaps their mind went back to Solomon, in the height of his glory, Solomon, who made silver as common as stone in Jerusalem. Solomon, who in the height of his glory and prosperity, when the queen of Sheba came to him, she was faint of breath and said, behold, the half was not told me. The report is greater than I had heard. So treasure expands our imagination in this way. And then the pearls. Well, if treasure expands our imagination, pearls focus our imagination. And now back then, of course, there was no way to manufacture an artificial pearl. If you wanted to find the real thing, you had to have uh, divers. They would dive down deep into the sea, up to depths of 100 feet, to find them formed inside a mollusk. So they're very rare, very difficult to obtain. And as a result, they're extremely valuable. One source reporting at the time says that in India, you'd get a lot of pearls from the Indian Ocean. In India, the pearl was worth thrice its weight in gold. So pearls focus our imagination to marvel at something that, yes, may be small, but is incredibly precious. Think of the natural beauty, the, the luster, the color, the smoothness. Something that the common man, likely in his lifetime, would never even catch a glimpse of. So treasure and pearls expand and focus our imagination. Well, secondly, would you notice with me the hiddenness of the kingdom of heaven? The hiddenness of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, do you notice one of the key differences between these two parables? In the first, it appears that the man happens upon the treasure. A treasure is hidden in a field here, which the man simply found. And we're not given in the text any indication that he was looking for it. He didn't have an extensive search or an excavation project. We don't even know why he was digging in that field to begin with. But he just stumbled upon the treasure. In the second parable, by way of contrast, the merchant was in search of fine parables. He's actively looking for them when he comes across one in particular. So what can we say about the difference? Well, I think these two variations capture a range of human experience. 
They capture a range of human experience. On the one hand, there are many people who come to Christ who were never looking for him in the first place. If you are a covenant child, you were born into the church, this is clearly you. You weren't looking for Christ. You didn't do an extensive search. But if you now profess Christ in, in, uh, later on in life, it was handed to you. You weren't looking for it. But not just for our covenant children. I can think of multiple examples of people in life I've known who all of a sudden found themselves with a Christian friend and hearing something of the Bible and the gospel and they just so happened to find it all started to make sense. And before they knew it, they think they're a Christian. These are the people who stumble upon it like the man and the treasure. On the other hand, there are those whose stories are reminiscent of the merchant. Uh, like the merchant searching for fine pearls. There are unbelievers who have a genuine thirst for something in this life. You know, they, they know there's got to be something more to life out there. They have a, a desire for something deeper, some kind of truth. I think we'd have to say, arguably, a lot of these people do get some things right. By God's common grace, there are unbelievers who get a lot right by the light of nature. They are industrious. They work hard. They, they see a lot of things. Uh, Jesus told one of the scribes who answered him wisely that he was not far from the kingdom of God. And I would say there's a lot of people who might fit that description today. They're like the merchant who has an eye for the pearls. They have an eye for truths, for perspectives on life that are so close to salvation, but are not quite the real thing. So in these two parables is captured a range of human experience. Now, of course, we know ultimately that there are only two states you either belong to the kingdom of heaven or you don't you're either in christ or you're not we know for instance ephesians 2 that unbelievers are dead in their trespasses and sins or uh, as it says in second corinthians 4 we know the minds of unbelievers are blinded but that binary reality plays out in different forms in the course of human experience. You know, some believers stumble upon the gospel without even looking for it, while others are looking for something, perhaps they don't even know what, and they find the truth of the gospel that surpasses everything else. Well, whatever the experience, however much someone may be looking for it or not, there is undoubtedly a hiddenness to the kingdom of heaven. It's buried in an unmarked field. It's like a small pearl, easy to miss among all the other valuables of life. So it is with the kingdom of heaven. The Lord must open your eyes to believe the gospel. The Holy Spirit must open the eyes of the unbeliever if he is to find the kingdom. Mind you, it's not just unbelievers who have a hard time seeing it. Uh, we might say unbelievers are categorically blind, but believers have spiritual myopia. Uh, believers suffer from spiritual short-sightedness. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 1, he prays for the Christian saints there, he's praying for believers, and he says he prays for them to have the eyes of their heart enlightened, that they may know what is the hope to which they have been called. You see, what well, you don't see, that's the point, but you see, for the time being, before Christ returns, there is a hiddenness to the kingdom of heaven. Even believers don't fully see, we don't fully grasp the kingdom of heaven. But here is the salient point that I would like us to see this morning. That the kingdom's value is in no way diminished by its being hidden from you. 
the kingdom's value is in no way diminished by its being hidden from view. It's no less precious because it's overlooked by the world. Some of you will remember the Washington Post experiment of 2007. A Friday morning in 2007, at a metro station in Washington, D.C., commuters were on their regular routine to work. That morning, there was a man busking in the station playing the violin. Nothing out of the ordinary there, just a man in a baseball cap and jeans playing for loose change. Well, for the 45 minutes he played, about a thousand people walked past and seven people stopped to listen for any length of time. The trick is that that was no random man. That was the world-renowned classical violin player, Joshua Bell, playing on a three and a half million dollar violin, playing pieces that he would have you would pay over $100 to pay to, for a ticket to hear. And most people walked by without paying any notice. But was his music any less valuable because of that? His fingers weren't glued that morning. He hadn't lost his sense of rhythm. Apparently, the acoustics of the station were surprisingly good. No, that was beautiful music from the bow of a maestro. And something can be overlooked, but it doesn't diminish its value. You know, in an age of superficiality, I think we need to learn this lesson. Uh, We live in a world where nothing has value unless it's seen and recognized. You go on a superb vacation, pictures are never happened. You have a happily fa- fa- happy family life. Let me see your updates. We are addicted to validation, are we not? It's why people care so much about how many likes they got on Instagram, how many followers they have on Twitter. It's why people have uh, symbols of status like fancy cars or some people crave affirmation for the way their body looks. We live in a world where it's not okay to be content with what you have, your spouse, your job, your lifestyle. No, the world must approve the worth of what you have. And as Christians, I think, let's be honest. Don't we get sucked up in the validation trap? We want the respect of our peers, the approval of the world. And we want those things that are seen to be valuable. But the most valuable thing of all, the kingdom of heaven, for the time being, cannot be seen. The man in our parable had no idea just how far down underground the treasure was stockpiled. And in this life, we don't yet appreciate the sheer weight of the kingdom. Remember what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Well, this is the hiddenness of the kingdom. Now, thirdly, I'd like you to notice with me the compulsion of the kingdom, the compulsion of the kingdom. Eric Laws, uh, the man back in my story from Suffolk, upon discovering the Roman treasure in England, felt compelled to do something. All credit to him, he, he did the right thing. He felt compelled to tell the authorities. And he got rewarded in the end for doing so with the millions of pounds. What about our man in the field with his treasure? You notice how he was compelled? He was compelled to cover it up, to keep it secret and safe. You see, Eric Law has got his reward by giving up the treasure. But for the man who finds the kingdom of heaven, there is no greater reward. 
It's why we're told that in his joy he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Same with the merchant. He sold all his possessions just so he could afford his little pearl. So if I may press the point here, there is a compulsion to the kingdom of heaven. If you find the kingdom of heaven, you cannot help yourself. And I think we see this compulsion in a couple of ways. Uh, First is in a holy jealousy. A holy jealousy. Both the man and the merchant have something too good to be passed up, and they have a a holy jealousy to make it their own. Uh, I am reminded of the story of a young Christian man who was sitting in the choir at church one day, he sat behind the preacher, when a young lady came in the church doors for the first time. And he couldn't help but notice that she seemed, seemed rather reverential, just sort of bowing her head at the right points and taking notes and all of these sorts of things. Nor could he fail to notice how pretty she was and how much he fancied her. And apparently, when she came through the door, he nudged his friend and said, that's my future wife. Now, I am not recommending that to any of our young men. But it worked out for them. He had a sort of preemptive jealousy. And the man who finds the kingdom of heaven has a jealousy and says, That's my treasure. Well, secondly, I think we see a compulsion in a joyful abandon. Both the man and the merchant gladly give up everything else. You want land? You want my possessions? You want my house? Take it all. Because I have found something with which I would willingly, gladly, joyfully renounce everything I have. I just have this one thing. You know, it makes me think of uh, the, the recipients of the letter to the Hebrews. Chapter 10, do you remember he says to them that they had joyfully accepted the plundering of their property because they knew that they had a better possession and an abiding one. So this is the compulsion of the kingdom. Once you found it, You will do anything you can to possess it. Well, this morning we have thought about the vividness of the parables. These illustrations expand and focus our imagination. We thought about the hiddenness of the kingdom, that its value is in no way diminished by its being hidden from view. And we thought about the compulsion of the kingdom, that if you find it, you will do whatever you can that you may obtain it. Now, finally, let's just think for a few moments about application for us. Let's be very clear about what this passage is not saying. Uh, These parables are not implying that we are actually by our own salvation. Uh, You know, that would fly in the face of all gospel teaching. You and I don't have anywhere near enough in in a spiritual bank to earn salvation. So we can only speak of buying salvation in a figurative sense. Think about Isaiah chapter 55. Uh, It's written there, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So we have no spiritual credit to buy salvation. It is a free gift of God. But don't let that blunt the force of the application here. Which is this. That you must be willing to part with everything for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus will tell his disciples in chapter 16, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And if you hear the gospel, if you have an inkling for its value, a taste for its sweetness, then do not hesitate to drop anything else 
that would put a barrier between you and finally obtaining it? Is there a pleasurable but sinful habit in your life? Drop it. Uh, Do you have a well-paying job that eats into your time with the Lord? Consider uh, dropping out of it or at least limiting your hours. If you have friends who lead you into sin, be wise about whether you should spend time with them. You must be willing to part with everything that you may get your hands on the treasure. Well, if that's the negative way to put it, there is a, a positive side to our application. I think we can put it like this. Cultivate an interest in the kingdom of heaven. Cultivate an interest Matthew Henry, the Puritan commentator, writes, a true Christian is a spiritual merchant. And we ought to develop a refined taste for the things of the kingdom. Like the merchant who knows the difference between shabby merchandise and the real thing, we need discernment. As he has an eye for the quality, the luster, the the color, the smoothness of the pearl, so we must develop an eye for the excellencies of the kingdom of heaven. If I may switch metaphors again back to the field. Uh, Proverbs encourages us to seek wisdom, understanding and insight. And it says in Proverbs chapter 2, seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. So we are to seek out, we are to meditate, we are by faith to better grasp the excellencies of the kingdom of heaven. Lord willing, in five, ten years' time, we all of us in this room will have a better grasp on the salvation that is to be fully ours when Christ will return. Um, I have in the past played a little a sort of mental game with myself, not really one I can necessarily commend, but having moved around in various parts of the country and back home, sometimes I've thought to myself, I wonder sort of who are the people with the influence, the power and the money who I've brushed elbows with in life? You know, so I've stayed with people who have had quite large houses. Um, I've I've talked with people and I've realized, oh, they're not that far away from this person I I know has a lot of money. But I've kind of played that game of how many degrees of separation am I away from a billionaire? I I don't know if anyone's played that game before. Again, I'm not really commending it. But then you realize that whenever I see just the most ordinary believer in church, the lowliest brother and sister, and I look in any one of your faces, if you're in Christ, I'm seeing someone who has more wealth than all the Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and all the moguls and magnates of the world have combined. There is a spiritual wealth to the kingdom, and we do not know how deep down it goes. I'd like to close by reflecting with you from a Calvin's Institutes. Of course, the kingdom is all predicated on the one whose kingdom it is. It is Christ, the King, who makes the kingdom glorious. And Calvin, speaking particularly about our union with Christ, he, he speaks of Christ as a fountain full of blessing. And this is how I'd like us to close this morning, by quoting a few excerpts from this, to lift up our gaze about the value that we have in Christ the King and his kingdom. He starts out by saying, if we seek salvation, we are taught by the very name of Jesus that it is of him. And then he goes on to say, if we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If acquittal in his condemnation, if remission of the curse in his cross, all these things. He says, if we want newness of life, it's to be found in his resurrection. If immortality in the very same. And then he says, if we want, imp- if we want protection, if security, if abundant supply of all blessings 
in the kingdom, if untroubled expectation of judgment, so you know your verdict of not guilty well in advance of judgment day, it's given in the power given to Christ the King as judge. And then he says, in short, since rich store of every good abounds in him, let us drink our fill from this fountain and no other. Let's pray together. Our Father, we give you great praise for Christ our King and the riches of the heavenly kingdom. We pray that you would give us eyes to see more in this life, just what are the depth of the riches of the kingdom of heaven, its preciousness. And then we pray that by your spirit, you would give us a holy jealousy and a joyful abandon, a compulsion that we would throw off anything that would hinder us, that we might in the long run, on that last day, know that we have obtained the kingdom of heaven, the treasure that makes all other treasures pale in comparison, the pearl of infinite value. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.